Hi, my name's Emma and I'm going to be talking about how we can use new technology and citizen science to rapidly increase our knowledge of fungi. Before I start, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land, where I am in Bacchus Marsh, that's the Woiwurrung and the Wathurrung. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to all Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders here today. I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. The Wild Fungi DNA project was initiated at the end of 2019 by my community of Plague Mycology. It aims to use DNA technology and citizen mycologists to rapidly increase our knowledge of fungal ecology in Australia. This will be through developing environmental DNA monitoring methods that are simple enough that the general public can use them, training citizen mycologists to work with DNA, and assisting other organisations to work with this technology for conservation purposes. So I'm just going to start with a bit of background to the project. Um, because fungi are quite cryptic, very little is known about Australian native fungi. Um, only around 20% of macro fungi, so mushroom forming species, have even been named or described, and probably about 5% of fungi in general. We know very little about their generation length, sporing frequency, or triggers to sporing, for example, fire. Most of the data that has been gathered has been by citizen scientists. Um, and this is all reliant on seeing sporing bodies. So for example, people go out, they go on a walk and they take photos of the fungi that they see and they upload them to usually iNaturalist or Fungi Map, and that data eventually ends up in the Atlas of Living Australia. So I'm just going to use the green staining coral as an example of how little we know. Um, until very recently, this was considered to be a very rare or endangered native species, but over the last couple of years it's just started popping up everywhere, particularly along the Maribyrnong Creek. So we now don't know if this is a rare native species that's having a really good year or if it's actually a foreign species in early stages of invasion. And um, next to it, that little orange fungi there, that's called the orange ping pong bats, and it's a highly invasive species from Madagascar. Um, so we really don't know if we have a threatened native species being threatened by invasive species here, or just two weeds. So one of the big problems caused by this lack of information is when it comes to protecting fungi. Um, in order to protect species under Australian legislation, they have to be assessed um, for their threatened stasis. And so far in Australia, there's probably only been a handful of fungi that have been assessed under the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. There's, I think, about 60 or so that were assessed at a workshop in 2019. Um, that's compared to the thousands of plants or animals that are on those lists. So, and we know that some fungi are extremely rare. For example, there's the tea tree fingers. It's only been found in five or so populations in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so it's actually listed as critically endangered. And there's a, you know, there's a few other species examples that have been assessed um, below on that slide. So one of the really interesting developments we've seen over the last few years is that we've seen a lot of amateur mycologists getting interested in um, genetic sequencing of fungi. And some people have actually spent hundreds or thousands of their own dollars getting this sequencing done. Usually it's done through um, certain overseas labs or through individuals in other countries. And in a lot of ways it's been really impressive watching people who haven't been trained in science um, just training themselves up to do basic bioinformatics and phylogeny. Um, on the right is an example of an Australian Pleurotus that citizen scientist Jonathan McGiven had sequenced in order to find out whether it was edible or not a few years back, and it turned out it was. Um, the problem, though, is that this data isn't really usable for scientific purposes, and the reason for that is that there's a lack of collecting permits, which means that people can't take herbarium specimens, and the lack of herbarium specimens means that the data isn't replicable. The other problem is that sending specimens overseas violates the Nagoya Protocol against biopiracy. Um, so how do we turn all this energy and work into usable scientific data? So it was with this goal in mind that um, my community applied mycology was formed. Um, at a, it started at a DNA barcoding workshop at a community lab called Bioquisitive in 2018. Um, and since then it's expanded out to provide training and resources for citizen mycologists in a variety of topics, for example, mushroom identification, growing mushrooms, mycoremediation, mycomaterials ecology, microscopy, and of course DNA.
We've recently been able to set up our own laboratory space um, called Mycelium Laboratories. Um, and this has a lot of resources and equipment such as for culturing and growing mushrooms, um, microscopes, uh, DNA sequencing equipment such as PCR and gel electrophoresis. And we also have some portable equipment that can be used for doing workshops in other areas. So this brings us back to the Wild Fungi DNA project. Um, in early 2020, we received a grant from the Wet and Whole Environment Trust to go ahead with the project. And um, this slide just shows some of our partner organisations as well. So one of the things that prompted us to start the Wild Fungi DNA project was finding out that you can now buy a portable DNA sequencer for only $1,500, which I'll talk a lot more about later. Um, but essentially, DNA technology becoming so much more cheap and accessible in the last few years means that we no longer need to rely on sporing bodies or mushrooms um, to see where which fungi are present in the environment. Um, by using environmental DNA, we can learn their true prevalence, um, their distribution, the effects of things like disturbances on fungi, and the relationships between fungi and other species. So we're taking two main strategies with our environmental DNA work. One is um, colour change tests. These are called lamp primers. I'll talk about them next. And the other is the mid-iron portable DNA sequencer. So the lamp primers. Um, LAMP stands for loop assisted isothermal amplification. Um, essentially, this is a test that shows presence or absence of a species in, in an environmental sample. Um, so the the pilot study we did was on the invasive species Favalachia calocera, um, pictured on the right. And if you look at the top, those are little Eppendorfs. Um, you can see where the, it's, it's basically a color change test where the liquid in the Eppendorfs is yellow, that shows positive, um, and where it's red, that shows negative. Um, so this is a method that's quite commonly used in biocontrol because it's quick and can be easily done in the field. Um, yeah, the primers we designed in our pilot study turned out to be very sensitive and specific. Um, they've been tested against nine other closely related species, including native Favalachia and some related Mycenas. Um, we've also produced a set of instructions on how people can design their own primers for other species. So the advantages of using LAMP is that it can be done in the field. Um, it, takes, it only takes about half an hour or so to see results. It's cheap, it costs around five to $10 per test and the cost can probably be pushed down um, using bulk. Um, it's a simple test, it's easy to perform, doesn't require much equipment. Um, and it's also quite robust against polymerase inhibitors, which are a bit of a problem when you're trying to do PCR with fungi or soil samples. Um, and the primers can be designed using free online programs. So going forward, um, we think that this method is actually the most likely one to be taken up by citizen scientists because it's so easy and doesn't require much equipment. Um, in order to improve the test, we need to adapt it for RNA so that that way we can see whether there's a living fungus in the environment or whether we're just seeing spores um, or, you know, dead material. So in the future, we're looking at designing a kit to roll out so that, um, you know, people can you know, other groups can do this. Um, so if you look in the bottom right hand corner, that's something called a pocket PCR. This is a thermocycler that only costs around $200. Um, we probably want to make something a bit cheaper than that as we only really need um, to keep the samples at one temperature for the lamp to work. Um, but yeah, as far as this test goes, the main obstacle is that there's a lack of baseline genetic data about fungi. So if we don't, you know, already have sequences of a certain type of um, fungal DNA, then we can't design these tests. So that's where the Minion Portable DNA Sequencer comes in. Um, as I said before, this only costs $1,500. Um, there are consumable elements, which cost $900 each, but you get quite a lot of, um, you know, in genetic information out of those. Um, other advantages is that it can be done in the field. Um, you can do whole genomes with this. You can do conserved regions or environmental DNA. Um, and one of the big advantages to it is that it can do long reads. So, um, you know, tens of thousands of base pairs long um, quite easily. 
So the drawbacks to this is it really does require a lot of other lab equipment. Um, we had to raise about ten thousand dollars on top of our grant just because of things we didn't realise we'd need to we'd need to buy. Um, it also requires very high powered computing to process the information. Um, and you really need to have a scientific background to analyse the data. Um, but I'll talk a bit more in the next couple of slides on how we're using this in terms of citizen science. So one of the ways we're using this is to try and get um, baseline data about Australian fungi through DNA barcoding. Um, barcoding, for people that don't know, is essentially just taking a conserved region of DNA rather than a whole genome that can show you the differences between species. Um, our strategy is to try and train up citizen scientists to take herbarium collections um, and send those into the herbarium under collection permits, but to send the DNA to us for sequencing. Um, so the advantages to using MinIron for this is it has substantially, it, it's substantially cheaper than Sanger um, if you do it efficiently, and it again has long reads. So rather than just getting um, small parts of the conserved region that we're looking at, the ITS and LSU and SSU region, we can get that whole region in one go. Um, the challenges to that though is that in order to use the MinIron efficiently, you need to put about a thousand specimens through at once on an individual flow cell and that can bring the cost down to, you know, two to four dollars a sequence, but you know, it takes a lot of effort to collect that many fungi to be ready to do that. Um, so for example, I think, you know, generally if you go out on a collecting trip, it's probably the maximum rate you can have is about five specimens per trip and that's creating a lot of work for yourself. So we're essentially looking at getting a lot of volunteers and probably spending an entire fungi season to get enough um, fungi to, to put through one of these flow cells. So one of the really exciting things that we can use MinIron for is metagenomics. So that's um, finding all the different species in an environmental sample. Uh, if you look at the photo on the right there, that was our trial run. And it's you can see the software has just created a little phylogenetic tree of the different species that we found in, in our soil sample. Um, so the benefits of nanopore sequencing for fungal eDNA is you know, mainly that we're not reliant on seeing sporing bodies anymore. Um, it's also a fairly affordable technology, at least for community groups. But one big advantage to MinIron is the long reads again, because if you're, you know, if you when you're working with a lot of unknown species, as most species are in environmental samples of fungi, um, if you can get that whole conserved region that you're looking for, rather than just bits of it that you have to then try and put back together again, you, it, your results are a lot more reliable. So it's actually a good technology in general, not just because it's affordable. Um, the challenges that we've had with it are we've, we still need to do a lot of work to refine our methods. Um, we also found that it's not that easy for non-scientists to use. It's not necessarily even that easy for scientists to use. Um, and as I mentioned before, it does require a lot of equipment and computing power. So how do we involve people who may not have a scientific background in complex areas like metagenomics? We've definitely had a lot of interest in this project and a lot of people wanting to volunteer, but due to being in lockdown or varying forms of restrictions for most of its duration, this has been largely left untested. We have been having discussions with other groups in Australia and overseas about how to involve people. And I think the main things that have come out of that is one, that collaboration is really important between citizen and trained scientists. And the other is that citizen scientists often have varying levels of interest. Some people might want to really get into project planning and others might just want to come along to a sample collection day and socialise a bit. So we need to cater to all levels. So I'm just going to end on what we hope to achieve long term. Um, obviously we want to collect more baseline data on fungi. We want to make it publicly available in the Atlas of Living Australia. We want to better understand fungi in general, in particular so that we can protect fungi. We want to improve land management practices, preserve the habitat of endangered species, and also assess species for the IUCN Global Red List. Long term, we're also looking at setting up a culture bank, so that's a bit like a seed bank for fungi. And just in terms of our broader goals, we want to demystify science. Um, the lab tests are based on one of the COVID tests, and by getting people to do this stuff hands-on, it discourages them from believing disinformation. And finally, we want to enable other community organisations to take up this technology for conservation purposes. Um, it can be used for any kingdom, not just fungi.
Thank you for your time.